Once again, welcome everyone <clears throat> to Light in the Valley Chapel this morning. I, um, we're not in a series right now for a couple different reasons. One is that we could celebrate today. Does anybody know what today is? It's one that we don't, we kind of tend to brush over sometimes. We, we celebrate Christmas big time. We celebrate Easter pretty majorly. But today is a different day, and we usually, it, it just tends to not be talked about too much. Anybody? It's the day of huh? Pentecost. That's right. So I was talking to some of the younger ones this morning in my family, and I asked them if they know what the day of Pentecost is, and they did not. So I'm going to start there. Is that okay for all of you older, wiser people? Day of Pentecost. We all know, I'm going to talk to the youth and the junior youth. We all know that Jesus came to earth in the form of a baby. Is that correct? Can I get some participation from the youth and the junior youth? Yes, he was born, and he was lived on earth for how long? 33 years, is that correct? Yes, it is. And then he was crucified. Do we know why? God had asked him to come to earth, take it upon himself the sins of all mankind, the sins that you committed yesterday, and the ones you'll commit today yet. Yeah? I hope not too many of them, but chances are. We're human. We're, bought, we're born that way. Jesus came to shed his blood to, to cleanse us, right? He was resurrected again. They put him in a tomb. Three days later, he resurrected. We consider that Easter. We know that? I'm getting very little participation. Do we know that? Yeah. yeah. Forty days later, after his resurrection, we observe here in this County Now, where I was born and raised in South Carolina, I didn't even know it existed, being honest with you. It's called Boat Foie Dog. I mean, uh, Ascension Day. <laughs> Doggone it. I got it wrong, Dave. <laughs> Please edit that out, Paul. <laughs> Him and Foie Dog. I always call it Boat Foie Dog. Uh, it's Ascension Day. What does that mean? It means that Jesus ascended literally, physically. I believe it was literally and physically ascended from the earth into the heavens. How many agree with that? Amen or no? Amen. That's Ascension Day. Today is actually marks 50 days past the resurrection. And it's called Pentecost. The actual part of the word pente means 50. So we're at that day. It's a landmark in Scripture. It's a, whatever you want to call it. It is a day that we don't observe very... Uh, nationally, we just don't, we don't make a big deal. Nobody's giving each other gifts today. I am giving the graduates a gift, though, by the way. Remind me. It's not for Pentecost, though. It's for graduation. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, we, we don't really write cards to each other, Happy Pentecost Day. We don't really give gifts to each other for Happy Pentecost Day. It's just kind of another day. And so today we want to observe that. I want to do the best that I feel God would allow me to do in honoring what Pentecost Day is. Here it is, guys. Before Jesus left the earth on Ascension Day, he promised his disciples that I'm going to be leaving, but I am going to send someone. God the Father is going to send you a helper. He's going to live inside of you. He is going to guide your thoughts. He is going to guide everything you're, you, that you do. He's going to help you in tough situations. I'm going to send you a helper, and that's going to come on Pentecost Day. And he told him when he ascended, he said, now, what I want you to do is I want you to go, and I want you to pray, and I want you to wait. And it brings us to Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to that, whatever you use to read. 
Turn to Acts chapter 2. I'll be reading it out of the New King James Version. The translation there uh, is a little clearer to understand. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13 is what I'll be reading. So that brings us to this day. Very, very interesting. If you read how many people were gathered in that room, they were in the upper room, so to speak, of this building. There was 120 people present inside the building that were all waiting and praying. In Jewish custom back then, in order to have an organization that was uh, honored by the, by the outside, by any religious group, they had to have 120 people. It couldn't be 119, it couldn't be 109, it had to be 120 in order for it to be sanctioned as a gathering of religious, uh, an event back then. <clears throat> and so today, I want to read this scripture. I'm going to try to explain it the best that the Holy Spirit gave to me. And here are some common questions that you hear in our day and age today. I, I know I hear it all the time. Are you Holy Spirit filled? How many have heard that? Am I the only one? Or do you have the Holy Spirit? I get that one a lot. Like I hear it in, in, in leadership where I'm at. And like I, I hear people ask, do you have the Holy Spirit at your church? I mean, you guys, I mean, and as soon as I hear that, it takes me to the scripture. So after today, I'm going to ask you, do you have the Holy Spirit? Just pay attention. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I had to explain to my kids that that is not a Honda Accord. But they were all in unity in one place. They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Who is they? The 120. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. How many were there? 120. Do you believe when it says there was 120 different flames lit, sitting atop of 120 different people? Amen? So the one question was asked to me, well, what happened with the fire? Did it not burn their hair? I will tell you, it was the same fire that Moses saw in the wilderness when the bush was on fire and never was consumed by the fire. Same fire. It's the fire of God. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Now, right there is where a lot of churches get divided and split up, and there's just been a lot of craziness around that line. Amen? That's where I want to sit down and let Furman or Lonnie or uh, Alton or somebody else wiser than me come up and talk about this. Because that line right there, where they uttered in other tongues, let's not get hung up with it. And as the Spirit gave them utterance, Verse 5, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from under every nation of heaven. And when this sound occurred, remember the heavy rushing wind, when that occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look, are not all of these Galileans? Galileans back then... Um, they didn't graduate high school, and they didn't graduate with a doctor's degree. They were uh, just more, uh, boy, I want to say it, but I'm not. They weren't as educated as others. Let's just put it that way. That was the Galileans. And here they are. They never took a Spanish class. They never took an Arabic class. They never took a French class, and they're all speaking their different language fluently, and they can understand each other. That's what he's talking about. It was understood by everyone. They were all amazed and marveled and saying one another, look, 
are not all of these Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Verse 9. Here it gets really tough. Follow me. I, I, if I pronounce it wrong, just look the other way or plug your ears. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, and I want you to take note of how many different nations and cultures that are mentioned here were there. They may have not been in the building, but there was a ton of people out around this building. There was 120 in the upper room praying, and you guys not paying attention. They were praying and waiting. I had said that earlier. Pontius and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretan and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed saying one to another, whatever could this mean? Verse 13 ends it this way. It says, others mocking said, they are full of a new wine. For you sanctified people, if you don't know how to translate that, they've been drinking. That's how we say it in the South. Man, them boys been drinking. Guys ready to dive into this? Who wrote Acts? It's been a debate. I will tell you, I think Luke wrote it. And if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels that tell us of Matthew, obviously, when, when you look at scripture, what I want you to understand is it's not necessarily in chronological order all throughout scripture. Okay. Uh, for instance, I believe they very strategically put Matthew first because he gives a more uh, in-depth description of the birth of Christ, which is the beginning of the New Testament. And I think that was done by, by God himself to do that so that we understand the birth of Christ a little bit better. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then we go on down the line. But I don't think they were all chronologically put in order. But Luke wrote Acts uh, and as we read Acts, I want you to understand, I believe what Luke was trying to do is, after the fact is, I believe that the Acts of the Apostles, that's the name of that book, the Acts of the Apostles, it's actually what they did. These are the things that they did. It's, 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 it's a simple title for a book. It's the things the apostles did. I believe it's God's way of reminding us, and it was Luke very intentional. He was a doctor by a trade, and he was very intentionally tying what the ministry of Jesus himself to the church today. And Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts is that link. So if we want to know what the day of Pentecost looked like back then, and maybe what it should look like for us in our church today, why don't we study what actually was going on? I'm going to bring out four different points of the power of Pentecost. What actually happened that particular day? I mean, the Acts of the Apostles, when you read all of them, it has so many different stories of, of the things they were doing. You know, it's, it's the conversion of Paul is in there, the road to Damascus. Peter's powerful sermon where he preached and over 8,000 got saved through his preaching. James and Stephen, it's in the book of Acts there that they actually, the account where they gave their life for Christ, for the work of Christ so that it can go on. And I believe so much that Luke is writing all of these events down, taking note of it so that there's a connection, again, between the ministry of Christ and the mission of the church today. If we read it and we study it, I believe we can understand it. God didn't make it confusing. He didn't put us down here on earth to get caught up on one line in a scripture verse or to get confused. Who is the author of confusion? It's not God. Luke understood that Christ came, he died, and he rose again and ascended to heaven. Matthew, Mark, and John also understood that. But Luke then writes the account, 
and furthers that. He not only came and lived and died and rose again and ascended, but the Holy Spirit came down. And guess what? Jesus is coming back again. How many believe that? And I cannot wait. The longer, every day that goes by, I long to see him more. This place is crazy. Not here. So the best analogy that I can come up with to explain what the Holy Spirit did on the day of Pentecost in the church for Jesus Christ is this. We go all the way back to the beginning where God created the earth. He took dust and he made and formed Adam. And until he did a certain thing, Adam just laid there lifeless in a dust form. But God breathed into his nostrils, did he not? And Adam became alive. That's how I look at the Holy Spirit coming down. I think Jesus had set his church. He had formed his church. It was on earth. It was just sort of there. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, he breathed life into the church. And that's what we have today. How many felt the Spirit of God on that worship this morning? Could you feel it in here? I could. I was lit up. I mean, big time. It, it was awesome. That's what I'm talking about. There's life behind the things of church. There's life behind the things of Christ since the day of Pentecost. Because they were waiting and praying. I'll help you guys out. They were anticipating a move. They didn't know what it would look like. They had no idea that the wind would start blowing through the building and that little flames of fire like, looked like fire was set on everybody's head. I don't think they knew that's what it would look like. They would have had no way of knowing. But they recognized it when it came. So Jesus formed and shaped the church and the Holy Spirit came to breathe life into it. The way that we see it today, it's a living entity. And I'll be the first one to tell you, Holy Spirit, in a modern-day era where we live today, it gets a bad rap. What's the first thing you think of when you think of Pentecost? Maybe your thoughts go straight to the word Pentecostal. What do you think of when you think of the word Pentecostal? All sorts of images come to your head if you're older than 20. I mean, first thing I think of, by default, used to, I don't do it as much anymore. I think about the churches in the hills of Kentucky where they get the snakes out and handle the snakes, Pentecostal. They don't get bit. You ever, y'all ain't with me, are you? How about a real long worship service? That's always in a Pentecostal environment. I have, I, I, I'm guilty, I've thought of that when I think of Pentecost, I think, eh, might get out of there by two. <laughs> when I think of Pentecost, I, 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 uh, I think back of a, an experience that I had as a kid. I, I, I was in the first grade, and my dad was pastor of the Mennonite church there in Blackville, South Carolina. It was a really conservative Mennonite church, and, and uh, the pastor from a, a Pentecostal church invited my dad to bring the family up. We're going to have music. And I get in there that night, and I was used to a cappella, deathly silence between the stanzas and between the verses. And here we come in there, and this place, it's like a club. It's jumping. The drums are beating, and I mean, people are getting crazy, and I'll never forget the pastor was up front dancing with some of the ladies like this, and I'm like, and about that time, as sure as I'm standing here, a guy from about this, this space here jumped and cleared two benches. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so when I think Pentecostal, by default, I go to that. Something, not... 
You know what I'm trying to say. So what goes through your mind when you think Pentecostal? Transformation. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Transformation. Amen. But it does, in the world that we live in, in the culture that we're in, it does get a little bit of a bad rap sometimes. And it's unfortunate. Maybe when you hear the word Pentecostal, you automatically go to the thought of they speak in tongues. And then you hear these people that say, well, if you don't speak in tongues, you're definitely not filled with the Holy Spirit. These are all questions and these are all things that we've heard as adults, especially around the topic of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to do the best I can to read the scripture and, and to explain it. Some embrace every single gift of the Holy Spirit, and while others are reserved and don't embrace hardly any of them. What makes this vast difference? Is it Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost? If you're Pentecostal, it's the Holy Ghost. If you're not, it's the Holy Spirit. That's what I've observed. It's all the same. Then there are those who judge us, judge each other, not necessarily us, but they judge each other by the amount of uh, activity or interaction that is exhibited through worship. They judge it. And I will just ask you very, very very simply, what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you know if someone is filled with the Holy Ghost? I'm going to ask each of you to look at your neighbor. You're getting to know each other. Just ask him, do you have the Holy Spirit? Do that right now. All right. Now I want you to look at the same person and say, prove it. How do you know the Holy Spirit is within you? How can you tell? Let's look at Scripture and let's look at the power of Pentecost. I'm going to tell you, number first thing I'm going to tell you is the condition of Pentecostal power. What was going on on that day? What brought on, what made God move on the 50th day instead of the 49th or the 51st? What made, what made him do that? What was going on? What was the condition? We're going to look at the purpose of it. Why did he actually do it? There's a purpose behind it. Then we're going to look at the uniqueness of it, how it all came about and why it's so unique. And then the last one, we're going to have the twist of the power of Pentecost. There's an oddity or a twist, so to speak, of the, the day of Pentecost. And I, my intention is that we all leave here with a better understanding. There is a condition of Pentecost. In verse 1, it says this. If you'll throw it back up there, Arlen, it says this. They were all gathered together in one place, in one accord. And I will just tell you this from my own experience. I, I love the things of the Holy Spirit. I go after the things of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not telling you that speaking in tongues or laying on of hands or if you want to take a lap around the sanctuary, be my guest. I don't care. I, nobody here is going to care if that's how the Holy Spirit's asking you to do. But before that happens, there was something going on in that upper room that day that I would challenge all of us to take into consideration. They were in one accord. It doesn't mean that they were all in the same room. That's not what it means. They were. But it goes deeper than that. They were unified in the expectation. They were unified in their beliefs. They knew that at the end, there was going to be the same result. And 120 different people got lit up that day. And they all spoke different languages. And it affected them differently. But they had the same result. Holy Spirit didn't, that day, he didn't pick out individuals. 
Say, you have it and you don't. I don't believe that's how the Holy Spirit works. You know what? Until you straighten your act up, you ain't getting it. Everybody was treated equally. There was unity in the house. Amen? That was the condition that brought on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that day. He descended upon the body of believers that were believing, waiting, and praying. And that's my, I trust, that's where our church is at. Each individual who's a part of here, who's here this morning, I trust you want that in your life. I trust you want the Holy Spirit in your life to the point that you will believe and wait and pray with everyone. There's, there's community there. You want to show me you have the Holy Spirit? Get connected. Stay connected. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. Be a part of the body of Christ. That's the condition that was happening that day. I'll never forget, I went to, uh, back in 2012, the church here sent me, I was a worship leader here, and they sent me to Bethel School of Worship out in Redding, California, where I was out for two weeks, and <laughs> man, those people, they know how to worship. I mean, we would stand on our chairs. And we would raise our hands. There was over 500 of us doing that. It was hallelujah, praise the Lord every morning, all day, every day, and every evening. And I come back, and it's like. <laughs> it took me, it probably took me that year or two, between a year and two, to get with the grip that the Eastern culture is not like the Western culture. They're not crazier than we are. We're not worse than they are. We're all human beings that the Holy Spirit will affect differently each and every body in here. Do you agree with that? So whether I stand on my chair to worship this morning and you don't, you shouldn't look over and say, boy, Mm, glad I ain't got what he's got. That was an experience that I had. And I've come to appreciate the culture and the heritage that I have come from. But I also appreciate the boldness that they portray in their worship. And I've come to the realization that we're all going after the very same thing. And that is to give God honor and glory and to manna, uh, uh, what's the word? It says it there. Uh, for the works of God. That, that's what our common goal is. To give God honor and glory. I don't believe that the manifestation of the Holy Spirit can be done in an atmosphere that's divided. It requires unity. Paul talks about those troublemakers in his scriptures. The dividers, the one that speak ill of each other. The one that wants to always put a wedge in. So the condition for the Pentecost was unity, but the purpose, what is the purpose of it. And so how do we receive the Holy Spirit? What is the speaking in tongues? What was it? 
Are you filled with the Holy Spirit if you don't speak in tongues? Well, I will tell you that Jesus himself was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. And in that scripture, it talks about that the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit descended onto him like a... And not once does it tell us that Jesus spoke in tongues. Was he Holy Spirit filled? Come on. Big time. So whether you speak in tongues or not is not the deciding factor for me of whether you're filled with the Holy Spirit or not. I'll just be that honest with you. There's other things that I'm watching. It's not if you speak in tongues or not. It's not if you lay hands on people and then they fall over and, and things like that. It's not what I'm, that's not a sign to me. There in Acts 2, the untrained Galileans were speaking in known languages, but that they had never learned before. And in, a, in an instant, they could speak that way. And people could understand that language. That would be like Denver speaking French. Tyler, you speaking Portuguese. Did you ever study Portuguese? You did. I'm sorry. <laughs> that one backfired on me. That would be like Becky speaking Portuguese. I know she hasn't studied it. Larry, it would be like you speaking Spanish. You haven't studied it. You can say "see" si and "gracias." That's about it. And all of a sudden, you would all be fluent in those languages. That's what happened that day. And they began to speak other languages of the world. So, what was the purpose that day? So, why does the Holy Spirit enable them to speak in a different language? I'm going to back up to Acts chapter one. Very same book, different chapter, different verse. This is what Jesus had told them before he had ascended. And he says, but you shall receive power. Somebody say power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, that's, it doesn't say to lay hands on people. It doesn't say that you're going to have some charismatic worship. He didn't say that. I think there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong. But he said, it's for the purpose of be witnesses of, to me. So he meant be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What was the purpose of that fire falling from heaven as the Holy Spirit was introduced? What was the sole purpose? So that they could minister and spread the gospel to every nation. Holy Spirit wants to take them into areas they had never been before. And the only way that he could do it that then was to install Rosetta Stone. And they went. And they did. He breathed life into the church that day. He wanted the world to know Jesus wanted the world to know what he had done for them. And that, in my opinion, should be the purpose of you wanting and seeking and going after the things of the Holy Spirit. Not for your gain, not for some fortune telling, not, not, not for some magic but to further the kingdom of God. Evangelism. Each and every one of us should have the fire lit on our heads to evangelize. And God, through the Holy Spirit, will give you the language to speak. It's going to look different for every one of us. Where's Kurt? I'm running out of time, brother. All right. Come on up. That'll slow me down. Back to Acts, Acts chapter 2. Take your time. 
<laughs> At back to Acts chapter 2. When they began to speak in this way, what was very, very interesting is the multitudes, it says, outside started to come around and they were in awe. It was being an attractant to them. It was, what they were doing inside the building that day was attracting the outside in. And what are we doing today? Is what we do here attractive to the world outside? Primary purpose. The primary purpose for the Holy Spirit coming down in my belief is for you and I to be evangelists in our own little world where we're at. Be a witness to Christ. So there's condition, there's purpose. Number three is the uniqueness of the Holy Spirit power. How many were gathered that day? 120. And verse 6 says that it was different for each and every one of them. There's a uniqueness about that. And I think the uniqueness is going to be, we're going to have to be open-minded and see that we all have the gift of the Holy Spirit. When we become saved, God gives us that. And it's going to look different for each and every one of us. And yet, Scripture also tells us that by your fruits, we will know who you are. So again, everything's looking different. The giftings are different. The way that we're called to minister might look different. But the fruits by what we yield is how you'll know whether we're being Holy Spirit led or not. He will definitely fill me differently than you. Different things, same result. So when the Holy Spirit does make his presence known, not everyone's going to respond in the same way. I'm going to say things differently than what you will. We shouldn't judge each other. The condition was unity. The purpose there was evangelism. The uniqueness is in the diversity in how we respond. But there's a twist in the Pentecostal power, if you guys would stand. It says, when that 120 were filled, some were standing outside, and they said, they are full of new wine. In other words, those people have been drinking. Peter gets up later in the chapter, and he defends them, and he says there's no way they've been drinking. This is the third hour of the day, which means it was 9 a.m. I come from South Carolina. We learned that if you didn't start in the morning, you couldn't drink all day. I don't think it's any different there. Peter was defending them and said, they're not drinking. They're happy this morning because they have had a dose of the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you the twist on that is what it looks like from the outside looking in. And, and every one of us is going to have the opportunity tomorrow morning when you get up and you go to work how you enter that office, how you enter your sphere of people is going to determine and it's going to tell them whether or not that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. These people were happy. It's 9 a.m. Are you happy? How many are happy to be here this morning? It's Pentecost. Give God some honor and glory this morning. It didn't just end when he resurrected. We should, we should give each other greeting cards. Happy Pentecost Day. I hope the Holy Spirit fills your life with happiness and joy, all the fruits of the Spirit. That's what we need to portray as believers. That's what the Holy Spirit means to me. Could part of being Holy Spirit filled actually be your demeanor? Could it be? Could it be that simple that somebody look at you and say, wow, she's grumpy this morning. Holy Spirit ain't near her. When you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you know you can wake up in the morning. You know it's going to be rough. That's life. But you know it's going to be all right. Because 
something moves inside of you, and that's the Holy Spirit moving inside of you, saying, I will be the helper that God promised to give you, and it's today on the day of Pentecost. We should honor that. We should celebrate that. Hmm. Paul says we're shaped to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How many want that? How many want to reflect that this week for the rest of your life? Allow the Holy Spirit to clean you. The Holy Spirit was sent to make you holy. He was sent to make you holy. That we look different. Anybody can be here for 90 minutes and put on a show. I would think all of you have sense enough to act holy in here. But what about Thursday? When life hits the fan. So here's what I want you to do. Next time somebody asks you, do you have the Holy Spirit? You say, no. The Holy Spirit has me. There's a difference. guide you into all truth. He will protect you from the enemy. He will magnify your steps. He's a gentleman and he wants you to be an evangelist in the little world you live in. He came so you could do that.